Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Law and Crime's Daily Debrief. Major developments today in the Connecticut prosecution of a man accused of killing his estranged wife. Several authorities say murder defendant Fotis Dulos, seen here flanked by his attorneys in court last week, tried to kill himself in his Farmington home by carbon monoxide poisoning. Dulos was slated for an emergency bond hearing today at noon in Stamford, Connecticut. He did not show up, and right around the time the hearing was set to begin, emergency crews rushed to his house, found him unresponsive, and began life-saving treatment. Dulos, his former girlfriend Michelle Traconis, and his friend and attorney Kent Mawinney are accused of conspiring to murder Dulos' estranged wife, Jennifer, last May. After law enforcement circulated not for attribution reports that Dulos was dead, his attorney, Norm Pattis, sent law and crime this statement. I am told Mr. Dulos is en route to the hospital with a pulse. Our thoughts and prayers are with him. That statement that Dulos was indeed alive resulted in a flurry of activity at Yukon Health Center in Hartford, where Dulos remained for several hours before being airlifted elsewhere. Dulos was transferred to a hospital in the Bronx, we're told, for treatment in a hyperbaric chamber. That treatment is an attempt to infuse oxygen into the body. Local police in Connecticut said they were called to Dulos' home because he did not show up to court and that they were called at 11.54 this morning. That's six minutes before Dulos was scheduled to appear. Officers from the Farmington Police Department were asked to respond to Mr. Dulos' residence for a well-being check because he was late for a court appearance today. When officers responded, um, they could see through a window that Mr. Dulos was sitting in his vehicle and he had obvious signs of medical distress. Officers forced entry and immediately began to perform life-saving measures. Um, medics responded from the East Farmington Fire Department, Yukon Health, and AMR Ambulance to assist with those uh, life-saving measures. Mr. Dulos was uh, transported to Yukon Health um, by ambulance where he is now listed as critical condition. Police would not say on the record that this was a suicide attempt. Instead, they're saying they're investigating this as a crime scene, nor would they say whether a note was left behind. They said they had to hold the scene pending further investigation, which sounds a lot like they wanted a warrant, and they said they were treating the house, as I said, as a crime scene. So two attorneys are along with us tonight. Let's start with Dina Dahl and Byron Brown in Arizona. So, Byron, it's still very early here, but let's take a what if. Let's say what if there's brain damage here. Legally, how does that affect competency to stand trial? Well, if, if he cannot understand and assist within his own defense, then he could be found mentally incompetent to stand trial. So it'll be interesting to see whether this plays out because uh, Dulos has appeared to me to be a little bit of a slippery fella. So... He may take this as the as the time to try to vein mental incompetency or whether in fact he really is mentally incompetent um, or maybe we just see him come out of this unscathed and everything marches forward as is. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of days, weeks. Oh, exactly. And under Connecticut law, multiple experts can indeed examine someone for competency. Dina, it seems to me that if this is a suicide attempt, then it will come into evidence against Dulos as consciousness of guilt, potentially, assuming that the case marches along. Do you agree or disagree? And how might the defense counter that? You know, especially with, if there is a note, like you said, there's still an investigation pending. But if it comes in, I think that the defense could also maybe try to make him look sympathetic. I mean, there are children in this case, and the tragedy is here. The mother is disappeared, and the father here really almost died. It sounded like they had a hard time reviving him. And that could be sympathetic as well. If I were the defense attorney, I would use that. Exactly. The defense could turn around and say, hey, look, we've been saying that, that he's being wrongfully accused, and this is the pressure he's under. So that may change the tactics going forward. Byron, last question. Dulos now scheduled for a bond hearing tomorrow. Even if he can't be present, is there absolutely any chance he remains on house arrest at this point? I don't think they can do that. After finding him in the condition they found him in um, for his own safety, I don't believe that they're going to keep him under house arrest. I think now they're going to move him in and they're going to monitor him and make sure that he's, uh, 
he's as healthy as they can as he can be under the circumstances. Exactly. I agree with that assessment as well. Dulos, of course, was home on a six million dollar bond. He has so far evaded substantial time behind bars pending trial, but not without getting in trouble for issues with his ankle monitor and last week for stopping on his way home from an approved trip to actually tear down a memorial for Jennifer Dulos. Here is some of last week's hearing. This is no ordinary memorial. If I lived there, I would rally and have community all be invited to put memorial right on Foda's house. Everyone should yell justice for Jennifer. I would love to see hundreds of people place flowers in front of his home. He can't remove them because he can't go far away from the house. This isn't a memorial to Jennifer. It's a means of taunting Mr. Dulos. Uh, Mr. Dulos is presumed innocent. He asserts his innocence in this court and is eager to go to trial, which is why we waive the hearing probable cause. In recent weeks, a man has snuck into, uh, has inveigled his way into his home and under false pretenses, recorded him, and is now trying to distribute those tapes. Mr. Dulos had permission to leave the home the day he did. He had permission for each stop that he made that included work-related stops, that included a stop at Stop and Shop. Um, he made those stops. When he got to the foot of the common area, he removed items that were there, put there for the purpose of taunting him. Should he have done so? No. I'm asking that the conditions remain what they are um, and that he be told it's a zero tolerance regime. Work related things are necessary. He's a real estate developer and the sale of one home will write a faltering financial ship for him. And I think a stern admonishment from the court would be sufficient to write this ship. The judge recall last week said, no, this is strict house arrest, no work trips, despite the financial situation. You heard rumblings there that it may be precarious for Fotostulos, and perhaps some of that is what led to the emergency hearing today, the medical issue, and that hearing being rescheduled until tomorrow. Let's head now to New York, where we heard testimony to bolster those witnesses who have accused former movie producer Harvey Weinstein of sex crimes. The judge is allowing extra state witnesses because the defense attacked the credibility of previous accusers. My colleague Jesse Weber has been inside that courtroom for us. After the powerful testimony yesterday from Miriam Halle, who accuses Harvey Weinstein of performing a forcible oral sex act upon her in 2006, it was now up to the state to corroborate that story. They called Elizabeth Enton, a former roommate of Miriam Halle. She first recounted the time that she herself was introduced to Harvey Weinstein at an event at Cipriani's. She said that Harvey Weinstein put his arm around Miriam Halle, pulled her in and said, this is the hottest woman I know. She then recounted when Miriam Halle called her and said that Harvey Weinstein burst into their apartment. In a comical moment, she discussed how Miriam said that their dog chased him around the apartment and that he was afraid of it. In fact, after court, Harvey Weinstein was asked by reporters, are you afraid of chihuahuas, Harvey? And he said, do I look like I'm afraid of chihuahuas? Elizabeth Enton then moved on to the alleged sexual assault. She said how Miriam Halle came to her doorway one night, spoke to her, and described the alleged attack. Enton recounted the details once again to the jury. She told Miriam Halle that sounds like rape and encouraged her to get a lawyer. She described how Halle seemed withdrawn and nervous after this attack. Then we turned to the cross-examination by Donna Rotuno, which was highly tense and very combative. Enton was pressed about allegedly not telling prosecutors or the grand jury about meeting Harvey Weinstein before, that she was the one who encouraged her friend to get a lawyer but not call police, that she was the one who labeled it rape. She was also pressed about the fact that she didn't follow up or check on her friend who was allegedly assaulted. Don Rotuno asked her why she didn't ask these seemingly routine follow-up questions about the encounter, like, why would you go see him after he burst into our apartment, Miriam? Enton kept reiterating the term sexual assault and rape after her comments with Don Rotuno. This is Jesse Weber reporting for Long Crime. And as Jesse mentioned, accuser Mimi Halle took the stand yesterday and told the jury basically what she told reporters previously in a press conference. This is some of what she says happened to her back in 2006. It was not long, though, before he was all over me making sexual advances. I told him no, 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 but he insisted. And then I said, I'm on my period. There is no way this is going to happen. Please stop. He wouldn't, take, he wouldn't take no for an answer and backed me into a room which was not lit but looked like a kid's bedroom with kids' drawings on the walls. He held me down on the bed. I tried to get away or tried to get him off of me 
and kept asking him to stop, but it was impossible. He was extremely persistent and physically overpowering. He then orally forced himself on me while I was on my period. He even pulled my tampon out. I was mortified. I was in disbelief and disgusted. I would not have wanted anyone to do that to me, even if the person had been a romantic partner. I remember Harvey afterwards rolling over onto his back saying, don't you feel we're so much closer to each other now? To which I replied, no. In a heated cross-examination, Weinstein's defense countered with emails Halle sent two years after that incident. In those emails, Halle told Weinstein it was great to see him at the Cannes Film Festival and wished him, quote, lots of love. Let's go back to our guests now. Dina Dahl, these cross-examinations of some of these accusers have been described as yelling and screaming matches, extremely tense, and we're hearing that defense attorney Damon Sharonis is doing many of them, so that throws out the theory that Donna Rotuno would be there to be a female cross-examiner to soften some of the tension in the room. That's surprising, actually. You know, this testimony, the more that the jury is going to hear from the women, I think their stories are all so similar and so compelling that I think that the prosecution is really putting on a good um, case here. You know, a lot of people are saying, hey, look, so many of these people are stacking up now against Weinstein, including unexpected witnesses, Byron. If you're the defense in this case and you keep needling at witnesses and the judge says, well, I'm going to let other witnesses come in to bolster the testimony. Ultimately, it seems like that tactic could prove to, prove to be fatal. Yeah, if they keep poking like you described, they're opening the door to the court allowing more witnesses to come in. So I agree 100 percent. I'm not sure what the defense is doing. Um, the approach sounds to be off-putting. I think if you're a jury listening to these combative back and forths uh, with women who have allegedly gone through some horrific events, I don't think they're going to curry any favor with the jury either. Good insight from our panelists tonight. Attorney Gloria Allred representing some of Weinstein's accusers. She's also representing several women accusing deceased millionaire Jeffrey Epstein of sexual assault. She reacted outside of the Weinstein courthouse today to a federal prosecutor's report that Britain's Prince Andrew is refusing to cooperate with the investigation into Epstein. Allred says Prince Andrew can expect a subpoena in her civil lawsuit should he step foot in the United States. He could simply authorize his lawyers to accept service of our lawsuit and anyone else's lawsuit against him rather than going through a long, drawn-out process whereby we end up serving him. Could you see yourself serving and him? And, you know, what essentially what appears he's doing is just stonewalling. The National Transportation Safety Board has released video of its investigation into the chopper crash which killed NBA star Kobe Bryant and his daughter. Bryant, who was 41, and his daughter, who was just 13, both died over the weekend along with seven others when the, their chopper reportedly made a climbing turn and then a rapid dive in mountainous foggy weather. The NTSB footage shows investigators examining the twisted wreckage from the ground and from drones in the sky. The aircraft was reportedly owned by Island Express Helicopters of California. The company states on its website that it goes above and beyond the minimum FAA safety requirements, far exceeding certain air carrier standards. Yet an attorney who handles aviation tragedies tells the Law and Crime Network that his first instinct is that this crash involves pilot error. Here's how the NTSB summed up what it found so far. The helicopter transited the Burbank and Van Nuys airspace at 1,400 feet and proceeded south, then west. The pilot requested flight following to continue to Camarillo, but Southern California TRACON advised the pilot that they were too low for flight following. Approximately four minutes later, the pilot advised they were climbing to avoid a cloud layer. When ATC asked what the pilot planned to do, there was no reply. Radar data indicates the helicopter climbed to 2,300 feet and then began a left descending turn. Last radar contact was around 9.45 a.m. 
and is consistent with the accident location. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, the defense has rested in the Florida trial of a man accused of killing his mother and his brothers. The defense tries to refute the state's timeline and attacks the suggestion that the defendant was somehow involved with witchcraft. That testimony is after the break. Let's head to Florida now where the defense has rested its case against a man accused of killing his mother and his brothers. Donald Hartung faces a possible death sentence if convicted of killing some of his family. The case has ties to the Wicker religion, which prosecutors raised through testimony about what was inside the defendant's home and through a jailhouse snitch. Investigators described a bloody crime scene here at the other home where the victims were stabbed, beaten and shot. Authorities say the defendant went here for dinner and was seen leaving the night they say the killings occurred. The defense called an expert on the Wicca religion to refute the law enforcement suggestion that maybe Wicca beliefs played into the killings. If you were to use a sacrificial victim for uh, a religious purpose, you would want them to be displayed in some way that is surrounded with other ritual elements like incense holders, candles, um, pentagrams or other sorts of things like that. And there was none of that at the Smith household. They were all pretty much, as I said, haphazardly arrayed according to uh, the videotape I saw of the crime scene. And it was also alleged in the interview that the covering of the bodies had something to do with the Wicca religion. That's not true. Uh, there's no um, aspect in which an offering or something that is used in a ritual would necessarily be covered. Uh, I mean, the whole thing is you, to expose it to the divine and to be, bear witness to the act. So why cover up something um, that you are doing for ritual purposes? It just doesn't make sense. The defense called its own forensic pathologist to contest the time of death. Recall the state's theory is that the victims died after dinner on July 28, 2015, and that a neighbor saw the defendant at the scene leaving much later than usual. The bodies weren't found until July 31st. The chemical process of rigor mortis is going to be at least slightly accelerated by the obesity and the clothing on top of the men. So. The 36 hour range is actually very reasonable. So I've got body temperature that's taken me out into at least 24 and, and likely as much as 36 hours. I've got rigor mortis that's taken me out into the 30, 36 hour range as well. Those two are highly consistent and hence my, my estimate that their postmortem interval is likely at least 24 hours and could easily be up to around 36 hours. When would that put the death? 5.30 p.m. on the 30th. You go back another 12 hours, now you're into the 5.30 a.m. on the 30th. So uh, we're, we're going back into the 30th um, if you stretched it even farther than where I was comfortable in what I just described to you, you'd maybe be getting into late of the 29th. And that's at least a day before the state says the defendant was at the scene. The defense pathologist faced cross-examination about his estimates and gave a quick retort when he was asked the standard cross-examination questions about how much he's getting paid to testify for the defense. Before today, I have just about 20 hours in. And what's your fee for testifying today? Um, given that I came yesterday, I think we were doing a, a flat 10-hour trial day. And what's the fee? The same 400 hour, at an hour. I don't differentiate that. So right now you're at $12,000? I'm at about $12,000 having worked in the case for 14 months and haven't been paid yet. Yes, sir. A lot of time spent on time of death uh, in your testimony. And I think you were, you were pretty clear a lot of different variables. Correct? Yes, sir. And that's why you kept qualifying your answer as an estimate. Correct? Yes, that's all it can ever be is an estimate. You can't sit here and say within any degree of scientific certainty that it occurred on the 29th at 10 o'clock, on the 30th at 9 a.m., on the 28th at 7 p.m. I can't give you with scientific or medical certainty any estimate that gives you a precise hour and date, although the third example you gave going back to the 28th is outside the range that I testified to. 
And a crime scene technician who took the stand for the state was called back to testify again. The defense wanted to know why she did not swab for DNA at several key places, including a thermostat. The room temperature may have affected the temperature of the bodies and influenced the determination of the times of death of the victims. I went back to her room. Yes, ma'am. I didn't go in her closet. Okay, you photographed the entrance to the closet? Yes, ma'am. But you didn't actually walk in there? No, ma'am. When you photographed the entrance to the closet, did you see a safe anywhere? No, ma'am. Also, when you were at the scene on that same day, did you turn over Richard's body? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you see who did? Uh, it would probably be the medical examiner's office people. Okay, but that's just speculation on your part? I don't normally touch the bodies. Okay. There were over 400 pieces of evidence that were collected. Did you change gloves after you handled each single piece of evidence? No, ma'am. Did you fingerprint that thermostat? No, ma'am. Did you swab it for DNA? No, ma'am. Do you know who turned down the temperature on that thermostat? No, ma'am. Okay, let's jump in with analysis one last time here. Dina, we've got this defense expert on the stand saying that deaths happened about one to two days after the defendant was seen leaving the scene under these allegedly mysterious circumstances. Is that enough for reasonable doubt? No, because he didn't, he wasn't so certain. He was saying he didn't quite know. And I think there's enough other evidence, like the cell phone that stopped working after 8 p.m. and the fact that his dinner was still in the stomach with one of the other victims. There's enough other evidence that supports an evening uh, homicide here that I don't think he really um, discredited it in, enough. So maybe a little bit of discrediting, but Dina, you're still buying the state's case here. So Byron, uh, look, um, we've got a crime scene tech who had her own legal trouble. She was on the stand twice. We've got a medical examiner for the state who resigned under what many people would consider a scandal. We've got a jailhouse snitch testifying. Who do you believe here? Yeah, I mean, great point. I think everything that you just said, on top of it, you got the possible contamination of DNA, um, you have his DNA not on the hammer, which is supposedly maybe the murder weapon. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if one of these things in and of themselves creates reasonable doubt, but I think you put them all together and the defense could have done a successful job. Exactly. Of yeah. Hey, we're out of time, folks. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Debrief.